Okay. Uh, PowerPoint, what are you doing? Okay, so welcome to week three. Obviously, it's not really week three, it's week four. Uh, we all got to have a nice dark week three. Uh, my power came back last Friday. Thus, that's why I was not answering emails, because I'd already maxed out my data on my phone. And apparently, Videotron said, no, we're not going to give you some extra data unless you want to pay for it. And I'm like, okay, whatever. My students aren't that important. Uh, I'm kidding. Um, so what I'm going to do today, we're going to dive into week three and see how much of it I can cover. I'm going to, it's actually, it's a topic I can cover fairly quickly. So I'm going to try to do week three, dive into week four. So it's going to be, you know, a full length class. And then next week I should be able to do the rest of week four because week five is actually pretty short. So I should be able to catch up because I planned like an extra 45 minutes per class starting on week three four and five in case of things happen. As an experienced prof, I've had things happen on a regular over the last couple of years. This was just a little more exciting than it last time. Um, about as exciting as when the tornadoes hit four years ago. Which we were out of power for three days that time, not a record setting. Like some of my neighbors still don't have power just two blocks away from me. Sucks to be them. Um, you know. I dropped off bags of ice to be nice. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, I'm going to start with topic for week three, and the topic is normalization. Um, it's a topic that is, at its basic side, very simple, yet some people have struggled to understand it. Um, it's all about cleaning up your data. So what am I going to cover today? I'm going to talk definition um, of what normalization is, anomalies are, which is the point of normalizations, is to get rid of anomalies. Uh, some of the normal forms, there are many, however, we worry about the first three, and kind of three and a half. Um, I'll go through the steps and then we'll do an example at the end. So data normalization is a tool to validate and prove the logic of a design so that it avoids unnecessary duplication of data. That's literally the purpose of normalization. You do not want to duplicate data in your database because that means you need to update the data or maintain the data in more than one place and that is points of failure. Um, so essentially what we're going to do as part of the normalization process is we're going to take uh, relations, also known as you know entities, break them down into its smallest component pieces so that everything is nicely structured, there's no redundant data. All right, so to, we need to avoid anomalies, so that's the goal. We're gonna you know, normalize, normalize the database structure so that there are no anomalies, and there are um, insert, update, and delete anomalies. And essentially the goal is, is that once you work with the structure of the database, um, any of the, an insert, an update, or a delete will not cause uh, data to be duplicated and or lost. So an insertion anomaly happens when you add a new row to the database, which you guys talked about insert statements last term. Uh, when you go to do an insert statement, you end up having to duplicate data that's already there because, well, the structure is bad. Um, I have examples of this as we get further in. Uh, deletion anomaly, you delete a row of data and some data just goes away forever. That should not go away. Um, in other words, you could theoretically lose the fact that certain departments exist or certain courses are available because the data is not designed properly. Um, an update or modification anomaly means if you change one row, it may force you to change rows elsewhere just to keep the data consistent. Normally when you update a row, so you update a person's salary in an HR system, you should update their salary in one and only one place. Because if their salary is different in more than one place, or uh, they could just fail payment because the numbers don't match up. 
Um, so in theory, you want to update somebody's salary, it gets updated in one place and only one place. So I'm going to be using this table that I have on the screen um, and basically put as I go through some of these examples, uh, we'll be referring back to this. So the first question that's on the screen is, is this a relation? Um, technically, yes. Um, there are, the rows are unique as in each row is completely identifiable unto itself. Doesn't mean it's a good unique, but it's unique. Um, and there's no multi-valued attributes, which um, I'll be discussing what those are in a minute. And is there a primary key? Yes, uh, it's an employee ID and the course title is the combination of what makes the row unique. So the anomalies in this table, essentially we cannot add a new employee to this table unless they've taken a course. It's impossible because the course is part of the primary key. Now, I can guarantee you when a prof gets hired at Algonquin, we have a big pile of courses we're required to take. Um, you know, learning how to use Brightspace. Um, some of the other courses on plagiarism and that kind of stuff. We have all kinds of courses we have to take. Has Wemis, that kind of stuff. Um, but we don't come in and already have courses assigned to us. We get hired and then we get courses. So that's an insertion anomaly where you cannot add an employee without adding the fact that they've had a course. You're adding more data than necessary. A deletion anomaly. So if we go back to the slides and we look at employee number 140, which is Alan Beaton, if we fire Alan and delete him from the database, we're going to lose the fact that tax accounting course ever existed. So if you look across the row, hang on, let me just grab my little uh, pen tool here. So if we look at this guy, that's a really straight line. Um, you can see that he's got tax accounting as the course he took. If you look up and down the course title list, tax accounting doesn't exist anywhere else. So that means that if we delete Alan Beaton, we lose the fact that tax accounting course ever existed. That's a deletion anomaly. It's gone. There's no proof it ever existed. Poof. And the last one is if we're going to give a raise to employee 100, we have to update multiple records. Again, if we go look at the employee 100, which is the first two rows, because the database isn't normalized properly, or should I should say the relation, she's in there twice because she took two different courses. That's kind of stupid. She took two courses. That means her records get doubled. She takes a third course. Her record will be in there three times. Take a fourth course. Suddenly her record's in there four times. And that means that you need to update the salary in more than one place. In modern database systems, this is still bad. I'm just going to say this is still bad. I'm just putting a disclaimer before I keep talking. Most modern database systems are fast enough that the odds of something going horribly wrong, pretty small. Uh, back in the day, when databases ran on tape to tape, which you know you might remember some of the old movies and you see the tapes moving on the big computers. Well, there was actually time when if the computer crashed while the tape was moving that a person could have two salaries. Because it's moving from one place to another. Or even back in the old days when we had the really old hard drives, um, like the old platter-based ones. And I'm not talking the ones that some of you may even still have in your laptops. We're talking about the old MFM drives. So the drives were yeah, yay big. And you could actually see the heads moving because the, the drives were so slow compared to today. Um, if the computer crashed while the heads were moving, you might lose an update. So suddenly, uh, Margaret Simpson might have two different salaries in the system. Which one's the correct salary? We do not know at least not in this structure. So those are the kind of anomalies. And why do these anomalies exist? Because in this relation, we have two different kind of entities. We have the employees and the courses they took. So we're basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to jam two things into one hole and it's not gonna work right because 
the things really aren't the same. So if um, it's a bit like trying to plug a European plug in the socket in the wall here. It doesn't fit. It might work elsewhere because there's a socket that fits it, but it won't work here because it's you know, the wrong kind of socket. Same kind of idea here where we're trying to put two things into the same socket at the same time, and they're two totally different things. So why do we want to remove anomalies? Well, the main purpose of a database, if you haven't figured it out by now, is it's to store and retrieve information. Uh, we need to do this efficiently and accurately. Therefore, um, we want to get rid of the anomalies so that fewer anomalies mean the queries are going to run faster. Uh, it's less likely to lose or have damaged data. Um, and queries get simpler because maybe you just need to pull a record by the employee ID, not by the employee ID plus a course name. The query, the code gets smaller and simpler because you are uh, simplifying. Okay, so since we want to reduce redundancy and remove the anomalies, um, we want to go through the normal forms, which is the first, second, and third. Um, for 96, 97% of databases, third normal form is more than good enough. Uh, Boy's Cod handles some strange edge cases, and then there's fourth, fifth, sixth. I know there's a seventh and an eighth, and there's like a couple of named ones mixed in there. Uh, pretty much anything past fourth normal form is pocket protector land. Uh, those are normal forms where some guy needed to write a thesis for university to make a point. And he said, oh yeah, well, if you have this kind of data that you know, you'll never actually see in the wild, you need to do it like this. Um, so pretty much everything after fourth or fifth is you know, academia, not real world. Um, and to be completely honest, most that are in third normal form are probably in fourth and fifth also. Fourth and fifth handle edge cases. Um, so we achieve normal forms by resolving the dependencies. So we want to basically establish proper keys that uniquely identify a set of data and only identify a specific set of data. Um, and if you go back and remember a little bit about a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about strong and weak entities, um, you're going to create foreign keys to handle those kinds of issues. So there's a few magic words that we have need to know. Um, functional dependency. The functional dependency means that the value of one attribute determines the values of another attribute. So for example, here at the college, your determinant is your student number. As far as access is concerned, you are 040 insert a bunch of other numbers. And that 040 number identifies to access your name, your date of birth, your address, your email addresses, phone numbers, accounts, that kind of stuff. So a functional dependency means that the data is dependent on a single key. Well, not a single key, but a, a primary key. And everything, all of those fields are defined by that number. So as your student number is your determinant for your name as far as the school is concerned. So if they want to look you up, um, I've never actually gone as a student here, so I don't know how they do it, but I remember when I went to college, uh, whenever I walked up to the registrar's office, they asked me for my student number. Because it was way faster for them to find me by student number than, you know, searching using other identifiers. And again, you know, that was 26 years ago. Things were a little slower back then too, but they're still, you know, believe it or not, Axis here is running basically, you know, the same software from 26 years ago with some patches over the years for a few other things. Uh, so a candidate key is a unique identifier. We talked about keys already, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Um, but the rule is, is that every non-key field is functionally dependent on the, the entire candidate key. Again, student number is your key. Everything else is functionally dependent on that as far as access is concerned. Uh, for anybody here who is working, you probably have an employee number. Everything at your employer, 
that they know about you is probably dependent on your employee number. If you worked at Ikea, you got a number. If you work at McDonald's, you got a number. Uh, you work at Walmart, I'm guaranteed you're just a number. Um, I had a student that actually worked in HR for Walmart, and they said, yeah, everybody's just a number. Half the time they don't know, know people's names unless they're a manager that needs to manage specific people. Um, so, for the first normal form, it means that there are no multi-valued attributes and every attribute is atomic. And I'm pretty sure I've got a slide that uh, explains that. Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, so, a multi-valued attribute is um, it's a list. So for example, skills would be a multi-valued attribute. When you're doing the initial design of a, um, an ERD and you have an employee, you might just have an attribute called skills. But a person may have zero or more skills, so technically it's another relation. But at that point, and, and sometimes when you receive the data, you're just gonna get a common delimited list of, you know, skills a person may have as part of their record. Uh, so, to be in the first normal form, there cannot be any of those. So there cannot be common delimited lists valued uh, in a row of data. Um, essentially, if you're storing a list in the database, that means it's duplicate data. There's going to be an empty and null values. Uh, it's a paint update. Let's say the person, suddenly you find out that the person lied and they don't have a certain skill. You actually have to take the record, split it, explode it, you know, take out the one piece implode it and stick it back into the database. Um, and every attribute value is atomic. Atomic means that it can be broken down into smaller pieces. An example of that would be a phone number. As far as most systems are concerned, a phone number is a, an atomic value. Yeah, in theory, you can separate it into, you know, the area code, the exchange, and the actual number. But I guarantee that 90% or more of IS systems, it's all, a phone number is a single field. It's not divisible by other pieces. Same thing with an email address. It cannot be broken down into smaller pieces. Um, an address, on the other hand, if you're talking about an entire address, that is not an atomic value when you think about it because it's actually made up of multiple pieces. It's a composite column, right? So it is not an atomic value. It's not at its simplest element. All right, so we're going to start with this table as an example. Um, if you look at it, you'll see that employee 12345, Arthur MacArthur, has two skills. That's a multi-valued attribute. And um, John Johnson has one, Alice McAllison has two. So these are not, um, this is not in first normal form because there's an actual multi-valued attribute. And if you look across the table, there's actually null values in some places. So the whole row isn't complete onto itself. How do you fix it? In this case, it's actually pretty straightforward. You just populate the entire table. If you look, the difference between this one and this one is that we just filled in the entire row so it's complete. And at that point, since the skill is now assigned to an entire row, not just like a value hanging off the side. That is considered to be in first normal form. There are no multi-valued attributes. Everything is atomic. Um, by definition, a person's name, depending on what the needs are, could be, you know, first name, last name, first name, middle name, last name, just name. Just depends on what the needs of the system are. But in this case, the name is atomic. It's a self-contained unit. Uh, so now, Technically, this table is now in first normal form. But there's now redundancy. There's duplicated data. So you can be in first normal form and still have duplicated data. It just means that every row is unique unto itself. So to be in second normal form, you need to be in first normal form and that every non-key attribute is fully functional on the entire primary key. So if anything is not dependent on the primary key, it needs to be uh, broken out into uh, its separate piece. 
Um, so, again, at the college, your name is fully dependent on your student number. That is a non-key attribute that is fully dependent on the key. Why is a person's name non-key? Um, I've had a lot of Muhammad Muhammad's in my class over the years. I've had a lot of common names, like students that have very common names come through because people's names aren't that unique. Un unless your parents got really fancy and tried to get really wild with the spelling of your name, um, odds are your name's not unique. So to be in second normal form, you got to make sure that every attribute is defined by the entire key, not only part of the key. If it's only defined by part of the key, that's known as a partial dependency, a partial functional dependency, um, which I have an example of. So to be in second normal form, since we have to be in first normal form, it means that there's no multi-valued attributes. Right? We had got rid of that first time. And we need to get rid of partial dependencies. So in this case, a partial dependency is, it can go either way depending how you want to look at it. Um, but the student ID is dependent on the course ID. And the course name is dependent on the course ID. So let me just grab my little pen tool again. And I have lost my mouse. Did you just die? Oh, there it goes. Okay. So course name is dependent on course ID. Student ID is also dependent on course ID. However, realistically, the student ID is dependent on the course ID in this case uh, because really it's coming from somewhere else and it shouldn't be there. It's, there should be probably be a table that joins them. So normally, how do you fix that? You'll take the partial dependency out. I've got much better example towards the end. Just take my word for it. My final example is significantly better. <coughs> so to get rid of the partial dependencies, uh, we have two tables now. We have a table that has the compound primary key of the student ID and the course ID. And then we have another one where the course name is only dependent on the course ID. Therefore, now we don't have any partial dependencies because in each table, the entire table is self-contained. Each row is self-contained and nothing depends on just part of the key. If we look back here, you can see that the course name depends on only half the key since this is the whole key. If we take it apart into two smaller pieces. And now we can update the course name in one place and only one place. We don't need to do it in two places. Uh, so technically, looking at these, this example, just so you know, we're technically also in third normal form now, uh, which I'll explain to you in a minute. So third normal form. Second normal, it means you're in second normal form. And for those that are having a problem of grabbing this, you know how you can't become a super saiyan unless you're a saiyan? Same idea. And for those that don't get the anime reference, well, that's too bad. Um, basically, you can't be become one thing unless you're the other thing already. So you can't be third normal form unless you're already in second normal form. And you become to become third normal form, there are no transitive dependencies. So transitive dependencies is the one that most people have a hard time understanding. So it's because... A transitive dependency is once you look at the data structure of, a, of an entity and you say, well, this field depends on this field, but this field depends on that field. Once you're able to go from one data point and you say depends twice before you get to the actual real primary key or the candidate key, you now have a transitive dependency. Once you start doing two hops inside of one table, you got one too many dependencies. So we need to explode it. Um, so the example at the bottom is, a depends on B and B depends on C. Therefore, A is also dependent of C via B. So if you end up having to say that A is dependent on B and then B is dependent on C, that means you've got a transitive because it's all still in one entity. 
So when we look at this uh, example, which by the way, uh, I really got to change these. The, you're going to be no multivalued attributes, partial appendices are removed, and then we get rid of the transitives. In this case, the transitives work as follows. The fee is dependent on the contractor. The contractor is dependent on the site. Therefore, the site is now determining the fee, not the contractor. Do you understand what I'm saying on this one? So the fee here is dependent on the contractor. The contractor is dependent on the site. Therefore, the fee by extension is also dependent on the site, which means that the site is now determining how much a contractor costs, not the actual contractor. So how would we fix that? We break it out into its own pieces like this. So you got a site ID and a contractor, then you got a contractor table with their fees. Um, technically, this is now in third normal form because there are no partials, no transitives, and no multivalued. Um, there's voice cod, which is, those of us that have been working in the industry for a long time, uh, find voice cod normal form long to be really long to say, so we call it normal form three and a half because it actually resides somewhere between three and four. So fourth normal form really isn't the fourth normal form, it's the fifth, but it's the fourth. So they decide to put one in the middle and it's called voice cod, so thus normal form three and a half. And essentially if a relation has more than one candidate key, there might still be anomalies, uh, even though it's in third normal form. Um, so that means that we're gonna get anything that is dependent on more than one candidate key, we're going to explode into its own piece. So the final simplest definition of voice cod, voice cod normal form is when every attribute or field depends on the key and nothing but the key. And to revisit the third normal form table, and when we look at this, you can see that the site ID has a contractor the contractor table has a fee, but the contractor table does not have a primary key. We never defined a primary key for it when we broke it out. Even though technically it was in third normal form, because there is no unique identifier for the contractor, we need to add a key to it. And if we do something like this to the data. Uh, so you got site ID one, two, three, and you got a contractor ID one. If you look at the contractor's table next to it, the contractor name and the fee is dependent now on a s synthetic key, which, you know, most of the time when you're resolving the voice cod, you are basically going to be throwing in synthetic keys to fix the problem. And if you're using synthetic keys as part of your design process, you don't need to ever worry about voice cod because you're forcing it to be voice cod right off the bat. Synthetic keys resolve so many problems because they don't rely on any other data. Therefore, it always is going to be unique. It's always going to identify the row because, well, it's synthetic. So now to go through the actual normalization process step by step. I have not had enough coffee today, as you can tell. Okay, so the steps in normalization are as follows. And we are only gonna worry about the left half of this diagram, but I'm including the rest of it for now. Um, so we, we start out with a table with multi-valued attributes. We remove the multi-valued attributes. We're in first normal form. Remove the partial dependencies. You're in second normal form. Remove the transitives, you're in third. Um, if there's multiple candidate keys, get rid of those, and now you're in voice cod. Um, then there's multi-valued dependencies, which is fourth normal form. Those are so rare um, that I've never actually run into them in the last you know, 15, 16 years. I ran into one case about 17 years ago. Maybe 18, 
I forget how old I am. Um, and then if there's any other anomalies, it becomes in fifth normal form. And there's actually normal forms that are higher than that, made for specific targets. But we are only going to worry about this. That's what we're going to worry about today. So we are going to start with a table that looks like this. And currently, this is not a proper relation and it's not in first normal form. Why? Because this row of data also happens to contain a list. There is no way to pull any of these items, and my mouse has disappeared again. So you can't pull any of these unless, because it doesn't have all of it. Same thing here. This one is made up of two things. So this is not a proper relation because it has multi-valued attributes. In other words, this whole thing is a big giant multi-valued attribute. So how do we fix it to get to the first uh, normal form? Is we define the primary key, which we've identified as being the product ID and the order ID. And we populated the rest of the rows so that each row is fully self-contained. At this point, we're able to pull an entire row because we're able to go select star from invoice where order ID is 1006 and product ID is equal to 5. Thus, there are no multi-valued attributes. It's in first normal form. It's not a good normal form. It's like it's not a good entity, but it is an entity. So now we're going to talk about the dependencies on this. And this is actually a pretty busy slide. Um, so when we look at this, we can look at the full dependencies, the partials, and the transitives. And I'm not going to worry about the transitives until later. However, when we look at an order, we look at the full dependency. Order quantity is fully dependent on the entire primary key. So order ID and the product ID tells me how many of it, that product was ordered for that order. The partial dependencies is the product description, the finish, and the price is dependent on the product ID. And the customer address, name, ID, and order date, these ones are only partially dependent on the order ID. So right now, to be in second normal form, we need to break this apart into smaller pieces because there's a variety of dependencies in here. Do you guys understand what I'm referring to when I'm talking about what's partially dependent on something else? Or do you want me to try to go through it again? Yeah, I'm getting blank looks, but nobody's saying a word. Hmm. I'm going to try to go through this one again. So the goal is, is we want every attribute to be fully dependent on the entire key of a given relation or an entity. So when we look at this, we know for a fact that the order quantity is completely dependent on the product ID and the order ID. So that one is fully dependent on the entire primary key. On the other hand, the product description, finish, and price, these three, are only dependent on the product ID. Therefore, it's a partial dependency because the order ID has nothing to do with the product description or the finish or the price. The order actually determines when it was bought and who bought it, not what was bought. Or actually, I should say, it's, yeah, exactly, what was bought. It determines the quantity of what was bought, but not what was bought. Same thing with these guys right here. These guys are only dependent on the order ID. It has nothing to do with the product ID, so those are partial dependencies. 
This is really gross, by the way, if you had to work with this data structure. If I go back over here really quick, when you look at this, you can see that, um, let's go with the entertainment center right here. So the way this is defined right now, the entertainment center is you have to update the data in two places for it, right? Because it's in here twice, here and here. If I were to go and delete uh, order 1007, we would lose the fact that an oak four dresser drawer for $500 ever existed. So we still have some serious anomalies in our data, even though we're in first normal form. So if we were to break these things apart, like such, so we take that big long relation and we're gonna splice it into three pieces. And when we look at it, you'll see that the um, order quantity is fully dependent on the product ID and the order ID. Good. That's an order line and it's in third normal form because there's no transitive dependencies, there's no multi-valued attributes and there's no partials on it. So it's already in third normal form. We're done playing with that table for now. Now we're going to, and then we take the product, which we had over here. Let me just clean off my, uh, my ink here. So over here, this is only dependent on that. Therefore, we need to explode it into its own piece. So we're going to take it, we're going to break it out. And we know that the standard price, the product finish, and the description is fully dependent on the product ID. Thus, the product is also in third normal form. Great, that's two down. So what we have left is the order ID with the date and the customer information. And now we still have a problem. We're technically in second normal form now because we no longer have partial dependencies. So the entire row is fully dependent on the primary key. However, with the order information, we have a case where the address and the name, both these guys, are dependent on the customer ID and the customer ID is dependent on the order ID. Remember when I, a couple slides ago and I said, if you have to say this depends on this, but it also depends on this. Cause I said depends twice when describing a single uh, relation slash entity. That means that there's still a partial dependency. So technically the customer ID doesn't determine the customer's address or their name the order ID does. How do we fix that? Take it, explode it out into its own piece so that only what's important to it is self-contained. So we want to do something that looks like this to it. The, we take the customer ID, turn it into a foreign key, take the customer ID, the name and the address, create its new uh, entity for it. And we are now in third normal form because the customer address and name are fully dependent on the customer ID. Now, if a person's address changes, we don't need to go through the entire database trying to find that person's address and, you know, depending on how the, it works, a hundred different places, we need to change their address in one place and only one place. The order date has nothing to do with the customer. The order date only has to do with the order ID. However, we don't want to lose track of who ordered that order. Therefore, that's why we create a foreign key of customer ID in it. So in the end, we end up with a, something that looks like this. And I really don't know if I can, oh, I can, look at that. Oh, that's as much as let me zoom in. Um, but that should be pretty okay. So we end up with something that looks like this if we were gonna take that, those relations and turn them into, you know, this is a logical diagram. So it's the spot between the conceptual and the physical. And so we have the customer, which we already identified as having a name and an address and an ID as its primary key. We identified the product as having a product ID, uh, description, finish, and price. Um, the order is a child of customer. It has an order date. And the order line is the order ID and the product ID and a quantity that was ordered. This allows us to change any of these pieces of information independently without damaging any of the data. A customer's name changes, 
great, you change it in one place. Um, this price for a product changes, great, you change it in one place. Um, if an order gets canceled, so it gets deleted out of the system, we're not going to lose the fact that, you know, we had oak dresser drawers available for sale because it's in its own entity. We can delete the order line safely without damaging the product. We can delete an entire order without losing any customer data because it's in its own entity also. Um, so this is an example for uh, Boyce Cod. So the table currently in this example is already in third normal form, but it's not in Boyce Cod. Um, that's because there are functional dependencies that aren't resolved. So the student ID and the major determines the advisor and the GPA. However, the advisor also determines the major. So you got this weird loop of, relation, of uh, relationships. So how do you fix it? You break it out as two separate pieces and you make the advisor the primary key. So a student ID and the advisor would determine the major's GPA. The advisor determines the major you end up with a table that looks like this. I mean, this is still gross by any stretch of the imagination. It's still disgusting, but it still um, shows how you would fix that first one into something a little more sane. Because at this point, if um, one of those advisors decides to have a change of heart and you know change what they're, they're they advise, it's not going to affect uh, the other table. All right, so that was normalization. Um, I fully realized that was a little fast. It wasn't super fast. It wasn't actually that much faster than I normally covered, believe it or not. I was faster by 15 minutes. Um, there is some extra reading in Brightspace for this. Um, so I strongly recommend reading it. I also have a few other resources. Did I just lose my screen? Well, that's exciting. Okay, let me just pull up my next slide deck and see if that just fixes it. Here's Windows 11, they said, it'll be fun. Uh, I can honestly say that's something that never happened to me with Windows 10. But I'm blaming PowerPoint. Because PowerPoint actually changes your display preferences when you start presenting. If you've never presented with multiple screens on PowerPoint, it, that's what it insists on doing. Um, okay. <coughs> now we're doing week four. Hey, look at that, we're caught up. Um, that's fun, eh? Okay, so time permitting, I'm only gonna go for about another half hour because there was a lot of information that just got dumped into your brains and I'm not gonna punish you guys with too much information. Um, so we're gonna talk about resolving relationships in the database design process probably is what we're going to cover for the rest of this class. And data types and the discussion about keys will come at next week. So we're going to resolve, talk about resolving relationships. So when you're doing a one-to-one -one relationship, you don't need to resolve it because it's at its basic. 
um, most basic state. Um, a one to many, it's optional to resolve. Uh, sometimes you'll want to do a one to many to turn into a one to one, uh, but it's really not common and it's probably undesirable. So just saying, you probably don't want to do that. Um, many to many, uh, the slide says resolving is almost always desirable. Let me rephrase that. It is physically impossible to do many to many in a modern database if it's a good database engine. Therefore, yes, it's always desirable because you won't be able to do it unless you know, you're using access or dbase or like Oracle 3. Modern database engines don't let you do that because it's such a bad thing. So the biggest one, the biggest resolution is the many to many. And essentially what's happening is it's two less of data um, that may have end up having duplicated data. And you, if you cannot answer questions like how many orders have been made, how many products did we sell? That means probably you need to do some work on your structure of your database. Um, so the example we have on here is an order has many products and a product has many orders. In other words, a product can be ordered many times and an order can contain many products. But as it's defined right now, there's no way to actually know how many of each product was ordered, uh, how many, and we can't actually tell how many orders were placed because of how it's designed. So how do you resolve a many-to-many -many, uh, relationship? You're gonna add an associative entity in the middle. Um, basically put an associative entity contains the keys of both of the parent tables. You may have heard the phrase associative entity if you've ever searched on the internet for database design stuff. You might have heard it called um, a bridge table or has and belongs to many table. Uh, or a, relational, a relation table, which is kind of stupid because they're all relations. But somebody decided to reuse the word relation for something totally not right. Um, so the example we have here is that a student ID, a student takes many courses in a course or subject, and a subject can be taken by many students, right? That's a concept you guys understand. There's many of you taking 8250, and you guys are taking many other classes other than this one. So Pretty straightforward concept for students to understand. However, how do we map that? Because with this current relationship, I can't actually tell what subjects a specific student takes or what students are assigned to a specific subject. So what do we do with it? We create an, an associative entity and we put it in the middle. So we create another one and it contains the primary keys of the other two tables. So we have a student table, we have a subject table, and there's a typo in that one. Uh, it's supposed to say a student subject, which at that point contains the primary key of the student and the subject. So this means that a student can be assigned to more than one subject, but they can only be assigned to each subject once. And each subject can have many students, but can only be assigned to a student once, the way this is defined. Um, this is where I take a segue a little bit um, from what the other prof would talk about. This kind of associative entity is all nice and fine for database systems written um, before Enron. Now, most of you don't know what Enron is. Enron, or how many of you know about Nortel? Okay, if you nod about Nortel, right? So that's Ottawa's version of Enron. The accountants were cooking the books. They were playing what they did to make it more favorable. Enron did the same thing. Uh, because of companies doing this kind of thing, um, auditing has become an important factor. Now we need to know who did what and when to our record. So often these associative entities in the middle now have many more things other than just the primary key of the other two tables. You'll have a date when it was created, maybe a date when it was deleted. Uh, when was it last modified? Uh, so you'll end up with additional fields on the associative entity. And it can get to the point where 
just the primary key of the other two tables isn't good enough. Um, for example, you work for an employer, you leave. You're gone for five years. You decide to go back to your original employer and they were kind enough to take you back despite whatever reason it is you left. When they put you back into the system, depending what their HR system is like, it'll do one of two things. They are either going to pull up your old record and reactivate it, or they're going to create a new record. That means that you'll have two entries in there as two separate pieces of data, and suddenly, you know, just using your, say, your SIN number and the job would not do the job, wouldn't be able to uniquely identify you anymore. Um, so when you're creating associative entities, you have to think down the road a little bit about what some of the other needs may be. And a simple one like this will probably work like, you know, 90% of the time, but there is 10% of the cases where you have to have more data in there. So you end up having to create a synthetic key. You have two foreign keys, but you end up having a synthetic key because that's the only way to uniquely identify a row of data. All right. So, many to many, uh, we need to talk about the design process. And the design process for a database is an iterative process. Um, in other words, you go over the process over and over and over again, refining it. You have to be aware that there's no such thing as a perfect design. There is always room for improvement, uh, room for expansion, room for simplification. Um, essentially, if you keep trying reaching for perfection to make it as robust as humanly possible, you'll just end up making a database that's totally unusable. Uh, that's a really common pitfall for young or new, I can't use the word young, that's not fair, new uh, database designers. When I first started out, I used to design and design and design until the point where the database was almost unusable because there was just so much crap being created. That was, all, it was insane. Like writing code for it was hateful. So this is something you learn with experience where you, when you do a design, you design to the point of, and I'm going to put a trademark phrase here till it's good enough. Good enough. As in, does it do meet the needs of what the customer wants? Yes. Is it, did you not design yourself into a corner? Yes. Good enough. That's when you stop. And you go play Escape from Car, you know, Tarkov instead of, you know, continue designing. You go do something else because if you've met the needs, you stop there because if you're going to keep going, you're going to make it harder than it needs to be to work with. And the design process is made up of four steps and an end of process review. So the steps are as follows. You identify, in other words, in this case, you identify the data. Then you describe the data. In other words, you describe it in more detail. You define the relationships, you normalize, and then you do a review. You go, yeah, that's pretty good. Well, that sucks. Eh, you know, it's not bad. And then you go back to step one, identify the shortcomings, describe how you'd fix it, the relationships, etc. So there is, in step one, identification. Um, depending on the source of data, there's two common paths that are available. There is the recreation or the reverse engineering process. Um, in other words, you've been hired by a company and they, this is actually getting rarer and rarer by the way, that has an archaic database system of some sort. And they will provide you with samples of the data, samples of the different forms that are used in the company, like printouts for like invoices or order forms, HR records, that kind of stuff. Um, and then you build it based on the information. The reason why I'm saying this is becoming rarer and rarer, um, there aren't that many companies now that are running on something that isn't somewhat pre-canned. Access is one of the rare things right now when you think about it here at the college, because it's still running the original stuff they wrote in the 70s. Plus, 
a little extra stuff, but you know, it's more or less what was in the 70s. If you ever wondered why, you know when you make your course changes, but it, you can't see it on the website till the next day? That's because the COBOL code, yes, it's written in COBOL, is running at night, at midnight, builds up some files, dumps them, and then there's another process that it looks for these files, rereads them, then updates the web portions of access for you. On the other hand, you know when you go rent a locker and it happens instantly? That's because it's not running in access. It's running actually somewhere on a more modern part of the student information system. Just so you can have like a, a visual of why some parts of this process are really fast, other ones are pretty terrible. Um, now, why am I saying that reverse engineering is rare? Uh, for example, the school is currently in process of replacing access. And they're actually going with a third-party vendor that already wrote an SIS, like a student information system. So they're just going to port what was in Access and move it into the new system. They're not going to create a new one. They're actually going to do a, uh, a data transform instead. Um, so that's what I mean by it's slightly rarer that you're starting with existing data and converting it to a proper database. It's not as common as it was. What is more common, though, is if you're coming up with something a little more unique that's never been done before, so you end up doing a clean room implementation. Um, anybody here ever have a boss that went for a vision quest? You know, the boss goes on vacation and suddenly your phone rings. Dude's sitting on a beach somewhere and he has some great idea and he wants you to start working on it. Uh, if you've never had that experience, count yourself lucky. Um, I used to have a boss that would go on vision quests on a regular basis, come back from his vacations brimming full of ideas. Most of them totally unfeasible. However, he'd come in and go, nobody's ever done this before. So you spend, you know, half an hour doing a bit of research. He's right, nobody's ever did this stupid idea before. So you start from a cleaner implementation, so you start thinking about um, what the data is involved. They're, they both have um, good and bad. Path one is good because you have concrete information to base yourself on. It's bad because there's a lot of legacy that you have to try to jam into a new system that might not fit quite as well. Path two is great because you have no legacy. You get to let your imagination run wild. By the same token, it's not great because it's really easy to miss something important because nobody's ever done it before, so you're just going to wing it. Um, so there's fairly common steps between them which are, you identify all the possible gross data object. By gross, not by, I don't mean by disgusting. By gross, I'm talking about the big pieces. You know, like a gross of gravel, not gross mud. It's, you identify all the big pieces. So the users, the customers, orders, whatever the Vision Quest decided they needed. Um, and then you're going to list the objects, categorize them, that's the one you identify. So you identify all the big pieces. And then you start describing them. So you've got all the big pieces identified. And we're going to use students again as an example because that's something you guys all understand. You start adding the basic pieces of data to it. Uh, you dip, maybe add a primary key, add a descriptor, um, you know, person's date of birth, their address as a student. Those are pieces of information. You add all the basic information. And as part of the, the describe process, you try to identify as many fields as possible on the first pass. Whether or not you need them all, that's fine. But you try to identify as many of them as you humanly can on the first pass so that when you're refining later, you're just adding a little bit, taking a little bit away, not adding entire things and taking entire things away. Um, you might even want to take the time to assign some data types quickly. For example, a person's name probably is not an integer. Uh, a person's date of birth is probably not a string. It's probably going to be a date or a date to, or a date time. A price is probably not an integer. It's probably going to be a numeric or a float or a real, depending on which database engine you're using. Um, so, as part of the describe process, you know you're going to quickly jot down what the data types might be. Uh, then you create the relationships, so you you know you identify you, you're draw, basically drawing your ERD. So you did your attributes, now you're drawing the relationships, figure out how things are interconnected. 
uh, figure out which ones are the parents, which ones are the children, figure out which ones are mandatory. Because in theory, you could have, going back to the example from about an hour ago, the employee. You could have a new employee that might take a course, but they may not have taken any courses yet. So that would might be an optional relation. On the other hand, um, a mandatory relation would be um, an employee's HR record. I know if there's an employee record, there's also a record that shows when they were hired, you know, when the last performance review happened. If you're lucky enough to work for a company that gives you performance reviews, you know, there's different things that get logged and those things might be a mandatory relationship because you cannot have a log entry unless you've got a parent record for it. And you create foreign keys as needed. Then you normalize. So you're going to have a database structure and you may actually have tables at this point that are good or bad. And normalize to break th down the design. And the rules are as follows. I just finished talking about normal form, so I'm not going to go through it again. Um, so you're going to create reference, t reference tables as you need. Sometimes you'll have things like that seem pretty straightforward, like shipping company or shipped by or shipped via. Uh, a lot of computer systems are really lazy and they actually use a drop down in the UI when the actual database, it actually puts in like FedEx. It doesn't actually put in, you know, a nice relationship. It actually puts in FedEx, UPS, you know, CANPAR, blah, 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 all the way down. And that means that if you ever need to change FedEx to something else, you got to update all the records and change the UI. You're better off creating what's called reference tables. In other words, it's like a list that has the possible values for a dropdown, and you just put in the primary keys in there as foreign keys. Um, replace fields in standard table fields with reference table foreign keys, which is what I just described. Uh, you want to get to third normal form. And then you do a review. Uh, you take a look at your design, look for potential issues. Ideally, if you're lucky, you're going to work somewhere that actually has peers. You can ask them to review your design. Um, in other words, you, a second set of eyes is like the best check for a database design. At my day job, I'm the only, only database designer. There's one other guy that knows how to make databases. Do you notice I didn't say design? I said make databases. He looks at my designs and he thinks they're overcomplicated. I look at his designs and, you know, they're still in second normal form because he can make a database. Um, database design is a specialized skill. You develop it with age or experience. My database design started getting pretty good at about the four-year mark after I finished school because I got lucky enough to get literally three jobs that I had to do database design as part of the job. Um, so hopefully you have a peer to double check. Um, if not, maybe you're lucky you have a friend you can ask to double check uh, as long as it's not proprietary and you know you didn't sign any non-disclosure agreements and stuff. Um, and after you taking the time, you identify the weaknesses, you start at step one again. Obviously, you're not going to do all the gross objects this time. You're going to identify the weaknesses and go through the steps to integrate them into the changes. And you also try to design with an eye to the future so that you don't design yourself into a corner and you try not to over-engineer. In other words, that's the uh, pitfall I was talking about. You know, young designers want to invent the best database on Earth and they end up inventing a database that can track, you know, the motion of uh, satellites going overhead while the, really all they wanted to do is track uh, what CDs they had in their library. So oh, that made me old right there when I said CDs. Um, they just want to track what games they have in their Steam library. So it's, you just try not to over-engineer, but at the same time, you don't want to design yourself into a corner in such a way that you can't expand the structure in the future. Uh, how do you know? You don't. You just try to design so you don't do anything particularly stupid. Um, you don't build your house out of solid concrete and then suddenly decide you want to add a bathroom and you have to cut through you know, a six inch wall to get of concrete to get to add a bathroom to your house. That's not designing for the future, that's designing for now with a very strict structure. Uh, you just want to not have things be overly complex. 
Okay. That went actually better than I expected. You know what? I'm going to talk about the test data. That one's pretty quick. Um, so when you've done your database design and you've got a structure made, you want to develop test data because I'm pretty sure there's only one or two slides. That's why I'm going to do it now. So testing is important. If you don't test and you think your stuff is good, you're probably going to have problems for a variety of reasons. Uh, would any of you guys submit any of your programming assignments without testing it at least once? I'm sure students have. You know, I've had some interesting submissions over the years. Um, so when you're running a database, it starts out empty. And realistically, as a database architect or a database designer, you don't really care about the data. You just care about how it's stored, right? You care about the structure. You don't care about what actually goes into it. However, all the peons, also known as the software developers, don't like writing software and not having data to work against because then they don't know if their stuff works. So you want to generate test data and populate your database. Um, it also gives you a chance to load test, to test how well your database structure performs. Uh, if you've got tables and you put in millions of rows of data, whether you expect to have millions of rows of data or not, and then you start writing complex queries and some queries suddenly just fall over and die for whatever reason. If you had test data in there and you were able to load test your queries, suddenly you would discover some of the issues if you had the data there. Um, there's many websites out there right now that offer um, this service. Uh, GenerateData.com, um, you can down actually download it and install it on your web server. It's written in PHP. Uh, they also run it on the main website right now. Uh, the current version is a little flaky. The guy decided to rewrite the entire thing. And the new version is a little uh, unreliable, <laughs> let's say. Uh, but the old version is still available for download, which is cool. Um, and it allows you to basically create realistic looking data. Uh, the new version is really cool because you can say this is an address. So you put in a person's name, their address. You can say, okay, city. Uh, but you can also say uh, specific data for specific countries. You can say data for Canada and the US. And you can actually make the city belong to the right province, to the right country, so that you don't have like an Ontario in the US. You have Ontario and Canada, and Ottawa would be in Ontario, Canada, not Alberta. So generate data is really good like that. Uh, Mockaroo is another one. It's not free. Um, it has a lot more options than generate data because, you know, like I've, they say, you get what you pay for. Uh, generate data is free. Mockaroo is not. Mockaroo's got some really cool data types uh, you can include, including like medical codes and uh, there's standardized codes that medical the medical field uses, and they've actually got complete lists of those. So you can actually generate data based on medical codes and procedures, which is nifty. Uh, big lists of drugs, all kinds of stuff included in there for the ride. Um, so uh, absolutely, when you go out in the wild, do some load testing with real data um, or pseudo real data, because those design sites will do a good job of it. Okay, so I'm stopping here. Oh, good. We didn't lose the screen this time. Now, if I go looking at what you guys are supposed to be working on right now, obviously you couldn't do lab three. Um, so I haven't, like I said, I got my data, my data, my power back on Friday, and I really haven't had a lot of time to go in. I'm going to go adjust the due dates so that lab three, four, and five, the due dates are going to get pushed down a week. I'm just going to be fair, you know. Uh, I know for a fact I still had one student yesterday that emailed me saying they still don't have power back. And uh, I can't really argue with them because there's still entire parts of the city where they're saying it's going to be a couple of days to a week still. Uh, whether to tell me the truth or not, I don't know. But, you know, I got to Take it with a grain of salt. So I still need to update the due dates for three, four, and five. 
Don't panic if it says you're overdue. Okay, but three won't be due till the end of this week anyways. So I'll, when I'm done here, I'm going to try to remember to go when I go to my next lab period and go fix it. Um, outside of that, you should be doing... Um, some people ask me about lab three, what tool to use. Um, I do strongly recommend ERD Plus for those of you guys that haven't started this yet. Uh, ERDplus.com is a website. Um, it is a tool designed for doing conceptual diagrams and only conceptual diagrams. That's literally what it is. That's all it does. Um, it was created by a couple of professors that teach a specific, uh, like teach this material in university. Um, it is by far the best for creating conceptual diagrams. It is not the best diagramming tool because all it can do is conceptual and logical diagrams and that's it. It can't even do proper physical diagrams. Um, it doesn't do flow charts. It doesn't do any of that kind of stuff. But man, does it ever do a good job on ERDs. Um, so I'm pretty sure actually I put that in the announcements previously. But if I did not, I will include it in this week's announcement so you guys have a link to get to the website. It's uh, ERD Plus is free to use. It actually has a built-in file manager. So all the diagrams you create there are actually stored on their server permanently so you don't lose them. Uh, there's no software to install. Apparently, we've the students have lost access to Visio. I've had to, a couple of students now approach me saying, "Yeah, we can't use Visio anymore. There's no way to install it." Um, supposedly, there's a Visio online that you guys are supposed to have access to, which apparently most of you do not. Uh, I know I can't get at it. So even if I, I can't help you, even if you do get to the Visio online. Um, so yeah. If you don't want to use ERD Plus, uh, Draw.io is pretty great as an alternative. Um, I'm sure most of you have at least touched Draw.io as a way to do a diagram for one of your classes. So outside of that, I am going to call it here and let everybody run. I don't know how many of you, I know some of you have class with me later this evening. As usual, attendance is optional. Come if you need help. If you don't need help, just don't come. Um, go home. Go enjoy the uh, thunderstorm that was raging as I was walking into class. Uh, no PTSD for anybody there. Um, outside of that, yeah, uh, have a nice day, guys. I will try to have this recording up by the end of my next class, like I usually do. <laughs>